Jennifer, want to come to the stage? Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to your beautiful country. Um, all the hosts have been so gracious, and it's been a wonderful time here so far. And I'm happy to be here to bring greater attention to this serious public health problem of parental alienation. Most of my research as a social psychologist has been studying the, in, the role of intimate partners on public health behaviors, such as HIV prevention, maternal health, infectious disease prevention. And it wasn't until parental alienation uh, started happening in my family with my husband and I that I started noticing this public health problem. And today we are here because of our children. The mental health of our children begins at home. And we need to support parents to create and maintain healthy homes for our children. This is why I will be talking today with a, a little different angle than the child abuse perspective. We'll be talking about this as a form of intimate partner violence. There have been over 500 academic articles written by social scientists such as myself and clinicians and legal professionals about alienation who have been working in the front lines with children and parents. There's also been many textbooks written for legal professionals and clinical professionals on how to treat and litigate these cases when they come into your door. There have even been laws, such as in Brazil, that put in place remedies, such as reversal of custody, restraining orders, and suspension of parental authority when a parent has alienated their child. And yet there's still persistent denial that our experience is real, that parental alienation is a real phenomenon, that the other parent must have reasons for alienating their child. This is a problem of basic human aggression that results in the suffering of our children and ourselves. People who alienate their children are acting abusively. The parent, we have to think about who the target of the parental behaviors are. Sometimes it is the child. These parents come to believe that the other parent is really dangerous or an unfit parent. And due to their perception, they will knowingly ignore and not consider their child's desire for a relationship with the other parent. Because they believe that hurting their child is a better alternative than having a relationship with that parent. But typically, the children are really only being used as instruments to hurt the targeted parent. They are weapons being used to hurt them. And these alienating parents don't only use children, they use the legal institutions, social institutions, friends and neighbors, and others around that child to hurt the parent. So the children are the unintended casualties of war. So if we really want to truly address this problem of parental alienation, we need to fully understand the kind of aggression we are dealing with. And regardless of the intent of the behavior, the outcome on children and parents is devastating. So I'd like to ask you now for a moment to step away from the idea of intent. And let's look objectively at what the parents are doing. They don't just badmouth the other parent. They don't just restrict contact with the child. They do many other things. Intimate mm -hmm. partner violence is what these parents are using to accomplish their goal of hurting the parent and the child. Intimate partner violence describes aggressive and abusive behaviors perpetrated by a current or former intimate partner. The National Center for Injury Prevention at the United States Center for Disease Control identifies intimate partner violence using four categories. I will briefly outline these categories now and describe how the behaviors that alienating parents use map directly onto these forms of aggression. The selected examples I will have here will provide, are, are drawn from a large body of peer-reviewed articles published 
on parental alienation. They're also drawn from published testimonies of thousands of adults who attest to having been alienated as children, as well as extensive personal interviews that I and my colleagues have conducted with targeted parents. These examples are not exhaustive, but they serve to show how this problem is another form of intimate partner violence. Some of the behaviors I will describe as well were mentioned earlier by Edward, uh, some of the other speakers, and in the video. But I'd like you to perceive this from this different framework, this different lens of how this is being used against the parent rather than the child. Uh, the first two forms of intimate partner violence are physical and sexual violence. Physical violence is intentional use of physical force with the potential to cause death, injury, harm, or disability. This dimension also includes coercion of others to perpetrate the abuse. Sexual violence refers to sexual acts that are committed or attempted by a person without the consent of another such as rape or sexual harassment. It's more difficult to commit sexual violence after the relationship has ended, but there are many who are being alienated who are still in their relationships with the alienator. And so this kind of abuse does occur. Indeed, targeted parents often report having experienced physical and sexual abuse in their relationships before leaving the relationship. Alienating parents often physically attack targeted parents at parenting time exchanges. They throw rocks at them. They push them. They often do this in front of their children and other bystanders, such as teachers and community members and neighbors. Or they have other family members do this for them and make the child and the parent afraid to be there. Alienating parents often accuse targeted parents of stalking when they have attempted to make contact with their child or find employment information about them online because they need it for legal purposes. But it's important to understand that though these behaviors are not stalking as defined by the Centers for Disease Control. Stalking behaviors are patterns of behaviors that are repeated and unwanted contact and they cause concern for one's safety and the safety of others. These behaviors can include repeated and unwanted phone calls, watching or following the victim at a distance, and leaving gifts when the victim doesn't want them. These behaviors have to occur multiple times to the same person in multiple forms, and the victim needs to feel afraid and unsafe for their physical safety. Targeted parents report being stopped by alienating parents for years after the relationship has ended. Typically, the stalking entails social media stalking and finding out information that can be used against them in court. But they will also convince domestic workers, such as nannies, to spy on their behalf and have friends, family, and other community members follow targeted parents in their cars or wait outside their homes. Many targeted parents are afraid to leave their place of residence because of their safety. The fourth form of intimate partner violence is psychological aggression. Psychological aggression is, uh, involves the use of verbal and nonverbal communication with the intent to harm the other person, mentally or emotionally. Psychological aggression, as Edward mentioned, is more damaging than other types of aggression. And this is the type of aggression used most often by alienating parents. According to the U.S. Center for Disease Control, there are seven dimensions or types of psychological aggression and many types of behaviors that fall under these types. Expressive aggression entails the use of name calling and degrading the target of the behavior, humiliation, and acting angry in a way that seems dangerous. Alienating parents use negative and derogatory words to refer to the other parent either directly to the child or to others around them or within earshot of the child. These names typically refer to the other parent in dangerous terms or refer to them as being unfit. These parents will go to great lengths to destroy the reputation of the alienating, alienated parent. The alienating parent will also refer to the other parent using their first name in order to undermine their authority 
or they will refer to the first, the alienated parent, as in the third person in order to create a perception that the other parent should not even be referred to directly. Many parents will also limit all mention of the other parent in order to erase them or be completely silent about them so they don't exist, which is the ultimate form of degradation. The alienating parent will mock the other parent's hobbies, personality, jobs, friends, and family, and will focus on the targeted parent's flaws and mistakes that they've made. For example, an alienating parent I interviewed called his children and the targeted or the alienating parent put him on speakerphone and the children mocked him while he was talking to his children in the background. Alienating parents will also yell angrily at the targeted parent in front of the child and others. They'll slam doors and throw things in order to scare them and the targeted parent. The second form of psychological aggression is coercive control. This refers to a wide range of behaviors designed to minimize the power of the target in order to control their behaviors. Psychological aggressors, aggressors, including alienating parents, use this form of control in many ways. Having the child's loyalty, and typically custody, gives the alienating parent the power to wield this control. This type of control includes limiting access to transportation, money, friends, and family. The limitation of access to children is a very commonly reported behavior. The alienating parent is often encouraged to and will prevent <coughs> visits. They will change pickup and drop off times to make visits difficult. They will schedule children's activities like sleepovers during the parent targeted parent's parenting time in order to minimize their time with them. Alienating parents will not share information about the children to the targeted parent to make the, or make their child's medical or academic records nearly impossible for the targeted parent to obtain, despite their having a legal right to them. They will also incur excessive attorney fees and court fees that leave many targeted parents financially destitute. Through the use of derogation and lies about past events, alienating parents turn anyone they can against the targeted parent, minimizing their access to former friends and family. The monitoring of the targeted parent's whereabouts and communication is commonly reported as a strategy used by alienating parents, and is quite similar to stalking. They will hire spies or enlist family members to monitor the targeted parent's behaviors, often enlisting the child to do this. For example, neighbors are also asked to inform of the targeted parent and tell the alienating parent if the targeted parent is entertaining a new love partner or a romantic partner or if they're even home so that they can maybe drop by. Coercive control also involves monitoring or interfering with communication without permission. <coughs> Nearly all targeted parents report this occurring. The alienating parent will read the text message and email exchanges they have between the, the child and the targeted parent. They will listen to all their voice messages Make the child communicate by phone when they are in the room, so as to overhear their conversation. And they will even force the child to communicate with the targeted parent on speakerphone, so as to listen in on the conversation. Many times, messages will not be relayed to the child. Alienating parents will often in impersonate the child by text message or email, so the targeted parent doesn't know who they were talking to. The alienating parent will also interfere with symbolic communication between the child and the targeted parent, such as throwing away or hiding gifts sent to the child, or not allowing the child pictures or mentioning of the targeted parent. The alienating parent will restrict or prohibit contact with the targeted parent's extended family and the child. For many targeted parents, they have not seen or spoken to their children in many years or even decades due to the interference of the alienating parent. Interference of communication also occurs when the child is in the care of the targeted parent. During the targeted parent's parenting time, the alienating parent will text and call the child incessantly and even ask the children whether they are feeling safe and need to be calm and rescued. 
They are implying that they are unsafe when in the care of the other parent. This interference detracts from the quality of parenting time with the targeted parent and does not allow the child to be fully present and emotionally available to them. Coercive control also includes making threats to harm the self such that the alienating parent will threaten to hurt themselves or commit suicide if the targeted parent tries to enforce their parenting time or seek intervention for parental alienation. They will also make threats to harm loved ones or possessions. The alienating parent will make threats about how the children will be financially destitute or psychologically traumatized if the targeted parent seeks legal assistance, or they threaten to move away so that the targeted parent won't be able to see them. They will threaten to get the other parent fired from their job or threaten to destroy the reputation of a new romantic partner or a family member of the targeted parent. And these are not empty threats because they often execute them. Psychological aggression also entails the use of words, gestures, weapons to communicate the intent to cause death, disability, injury, or physical harm. Alienating parents occasionally use these types of threats to coerce the targeted parent to stay away from the children or create an illusion of danger. For example, many alienating parents have an intimidating adult present at parenting time exchanges to be their bodyguard, such as a step-parent, a friend, or even hired help. The presence of a bodyguard creates an illusion that the alienating parent needs protection from the targeted parent and communicates to the targeted parent that they're in danger for being there, just for simply being with their child, wanting to see their child. And these threats made by the alienating parent to hurt the targeted parent are often so scary that they will have someone else go and pick up their children so as to avoid conflict. The alienating parent will also vandalize property when angered about child support and custody conflicts and send hostile emails and voicemails with threats that the targeted parent should be scared. Psychological aggression also includes control of reproductive or sexual health, which includes behaviors such as refusing to use birth control or coercing a pregnancy termination. Alienating behaviors are more common in relationships that have already ended, so this form of aggression is not as common. However, I have interviewed some targeted parents who were coerced to have vasectomies or be sterilized and then after they did this procedure, the alienating parent immediately divorced them, leaving them unable to start a new family. Psychological aggression also includes exploiting the target's liabilities or vulnerabilities, such as their immigration status or a disability. Targeted parents are often blackmailed by alienating parents to sign court documents or agreements out of fear that they will share negative information about them to others or to their children and affect their perceptions of them, such as having a criminal record that really has nothing to do with their ability to parent a child. I have interviewed several targeted parents who are expatriates because their alienated parent moved their child to another country. They moved to the other country to be with their child and try to maintain a relationship with them. But when they do that, I've heard cases where the alienated parent will make false visa violation reports and exploit their immigration status in order to get them deported. The amount of parenting time a targeted parent gets can also be used as a liability by the alienating parent. And this is one of the many reasons that a presumption of shared parenting and shared parenting initiatives are so important as a deterrent for this form of aggression. For example, if a targeted parent is temporarily given alternating weekends with their child when they file for divorce. And they have alternating weekends until the final hearing is set, which can be months or years later. This time span will be used as proof by the alienating parent that they should be the primary custodial parent. This strategy is often encouraged by lawyers to obtain full custody for their clients because many jurisdictions base final parenting plans on what the normal distribution of parenting time was prior to the final hearing. Creating an extended temporary order period with imbalanced parental responsibility provides the alienating parent with the ability to exploit the targeted parent's parenting time in their favor. 
The alienating parent will also exploit unequal parenting plans in order to obtain and retain sole decision making regarding the children. For example, the alienating parent will claim that the targeted parent does not know the children as well as they do because they hardly ever see them and they're with them all the time. So the, the alienating parent argues that they should be the one making all the decisions regarding the child because they know their children best and it's not based on the other parent's actual abilities. Psychological abuse also includes exploitation of one's own liabilities to control or limit the target's options. In this case, the liabilities of one's gender can be used to exploit the targeted parent. For example, an alienating mother can use gender stereotypes to her advantage, such that she can portray herself as a victim of abuse perpetrated by the alienating or the alienated father, but provide no support for this. Such claims are often believed because of deep held beliefs that men are more aggressive than women. An alienating father could use gender stereotypes to show he's a better provider than the mother who may be stayed at home, particularly if he can also include stereotypes that she is mentally ill or unstable, which is an easy label to place onto women. While being a breadwinner can sometimes be a liability, in this case, it's being used to exploit the other parent. The seventh form of psychological aggression is gaslighting. And this refers to the presentation of false information to the victim with the intent to make them doubt their own memory or perception. While this strategy is used most often by alienating parents with their children, they also do it with a targeted parent. Alienating parents will email, send emails and other written correspondence that rewrites past events in order to create a new version of reality that better suits their goals. The communication is intended to make the targeted parent question their own memory of past events and to create a paper trail of proof to use against the targeted parent, such as when they go to modify parenting plans. Alienating parents will also use this strategy with medical records, inserting inaccurate information about the targeted parent in the child's medical records, such as claiming the targeted parent is an alcoholic or has some mental illness that doesn't exist. They will also do this with legal, legal affidavits and other legal documents to make the retelling of and lies of past, pub, past events public record. Alienating parents will frequently accuse targeted parents of doing behaviors that they themselves are doing in order to create confusion on behalf of the targeted parent and to create the illusion to others who only see the outcome of the behavior that the targeted parent is doing things that the alienating parent is actually responsible for. This strategy deflects attention and blame away from the real abuser. Aside from the four types of intimate partner violence that I've discussed so far, there are several others that are relevant to the understanding of parental alienation. Legal and administrative aggression are manipulative actions that one partner takes using legislative and administrative systems to hurt the other partner, such as threatening a partner with litigation. <coughs> this form of aggression uses people in power to create more devastating consequences on the target, such as imposing jail time or restrictions on visitation. Although legal and administrative aggression is used by both alienating mothers and fathers, this form of aggression is more commonly and easily used by women against men because people are more likely to believe claims of abuse by women. Allegations of abuse, particularly sexual abuse, are the silver bullet in child custody disputes because the targeted parent has to undergo months of investigation or even years. And these false claims are very concerning to me as someone who studied domestic violence because they undermine the protection of the laws that are designed for people who really are victims of domestic violence. Many alienating parents do not engage in legal mediation or communication about court matters in good faith. They want, a, they want their conflict played out in court. They want extended court battles and fights, and they want to financially ruin and emotionally damage the reputation of the alienated parent, and they will use this to do that. 
They will give the appearance that they are rational or more flexible, but they will never concede or give in. Most of these parents will break court orders regarding parenting time or decision making, and then they will accuse the targeted parent of using this form of aggression when all they want to do is enforce existing orders. We define institutional aggression as acts that institutions rather than individuals commit, such as incarcerating innocent people or banning an individual from access to privileges like voting. It is not intimate partner violence in a technical sense, but it can be considered as such when the victim is targeted due to their domestic role as an intimate partner with someone else. So this form of aggression is used in parental alienation when representatives from an institution or a professional group, such as social workers, mental health professionals, guardian ad litems, teachers, medical providers, or police officers, engage in legal and administrative aggression against the targeted parent on behalf of the alienating parent. The individual who uses institutional aggression often has negative biases about the targeted parent, such as gender or racial biases. They have poor training in the identification of parental alienation and or human development. They may believe children never lie or are never manipulated by parents. They will often stop at nothing to limit or interfere with the contact or relationship between the targeted parent and the child. The targeted parent's parental rights may even be taken away due to severe injustices and in how their cases were handled. Now it's important to note that parental alienation involves a pattern of these behaviors over time. It's not just one or two things. These are not just parents occasionally saying something bad or doing some things. These are long-term enacted strategies and patterns that are enacted over time. And pattern, these patterns will also differ depending on where the alienating parent feels they're being most effective in hurting the targeted parent. Due to the power differences between parents and the loyalty and enmeshment that the children have with their alienator, this type of abuse is rarely reciprocated. For example, the targeted parent cannot say or do anything or even say anything neutral about the alienating, about the alienating parent without the children defending the alienator. In fact, they will use any comment that the targeted parent says as justification for their rejection. Parental alienation does not just refer to the behaviors of the alienated parent, but also the outcomes for the target and the child. And Edward provided an excellent overview of the outcomes for children. And they're not much different than for adults uh, or any other intimate partner violence. So parents experience depression, anxiety, social isolation, suicidal ideation. They attempt suicide and many times are successful. They have higher rates of substance abuse. Um, and I think most importantly, the targeted parent experiences ambiguous loss which is incomplete or uncertain loss, such as when a loved one is physically present but psychologically absent, like in the case of Alzheimer's, or when someone is physically absent but psychologically present, such as in the case of kidnapping. Targeted parents experience ambiguous loss for one or multiple children because their children may be physically present during their parenting exchanges, but very hostile towards them, or psychologically unavailable, or they're denied access to their child altogether. Ambiguous loss goes largely unrecognized by society. It's not, it's not acknowledged as a significant loss, and it results in what's termed disenfranchised grief. When you add the professional and social denial that parental alienation even exists, this disenfranchised grief experienced by targeted parents is substantial. The targeted parent is unable to mourn for their children publicly. They're often told by others that it'll just get better, move on with your life. And as a consequence, targeted parents are often unable to formally process their grief and have problems moving on with their lives. And social support is extremely crucial in times like this, uh, but one of the most commonly used alienation tactics is expressive aggression in the form of derogation of the parent, 
And so it undermines the ability of the targeted parent to get the social support that they need. Nearly all targeted parents report some level of social isolation, either due to the depression that they experience or because of the rejection of others caused by the alienating parent. This brings us back now to the question of intent. Now, I always, I'm always asked this question, how intentional is this behavior? Why are people doing this? Many alienating parents have personality disorders, such as narcissism or borderline, which makes controlling their behaviors difficult. However, the behavior is still intentional. They are engaging in behaviors that are enacted for long periods of time, and there's many, many behaviors they're exhibiting, so it's hard to deny the intention. Some individuals have argued that parental alienating behaviors are justified when they serve to protect a vulnerable child from an abusive, unstable, or dangerous parent. In other words, they argue that parental alienation is justified estrangement. But calling parental alienation justified reflects a gross misunderstanding of the difference between estrangement and alienation. Estranging behaviors are those that a parent does to damage their own relationship with their child and is due to shortcomings that the parent might have, like mental illness or parenting skills deficits. However, parental alienation are acts committed by the alienating parent against the targeted parent to hurt the relationship with the child. Like many other forms of family and domestic violence, I do not believe that parental alienating behaviors are ever justified. They're abusive to both the child and the target. When a, child, when a parent has shortcomings and they pose a real danger to the child, we obviously have to protect the child. However, there are strategies to keep a child safe while still promoting a positive relationship with the other parent. The alienating parent does not have to act abusively to protect their child. The alienating parent's portrayal that their aggressive behaviors are in their child's best interest are only a justification for their own abuse. Stopping all forms of violence, including parental alienation, promotes the best interest of the child and improves the health of the entire family system. So what do we do about this? The late and great John Stuart Mill stated that the domestic life of domestic tyrants is one of the things which is the most imperative on the law to interfere with. And I would agree with that because we are dealing with domestic tyrants here. And addressing family and domestic violence, which child abuse and intimate partner violence are, is not possible with just one intervention. We need legal interventions, but more. We acknowledge that this, when we acknowledge that this is domestic violence, we need laws and policies changed to include protections for targeted parents and their children, and to address the power differentials caused by unequal parenting allocation when both parents are capable and healthy. We can change the laws, but then we need judges to apply, and most importantly, enforce them and be accountable when they do not. We need to identify families where parental alienation is occurring and put clear expectations on their behavior and deterrence for violation of court orders. We need to shorten the time it takes to hear cases, as been mentioned by several speakers today, because that time is used to abuse the targeted parent and the child. We also need to fully investigate claims of abuse and require actual evidence in order to prevent the use of false accusations to obtain custody of children. We need clinicians trained to identify parental alienation and specialists who are trained to treat it. Uh, we are starting to develop good assessment tools of parental alienation and we need to use them. When a caseworker hears two very different stories of what's happening, this should be a red flag to investigate further, not put your hands up and say, there's no way we can know what's going on. It's a sign that there may be abuse happening. We also need to be sensitive to the context in which children are assessed, because this is important when you assess domestic violence. 
We also need training at schools for teachers and guidance counselors and policies for how to handle parenting time exchanges and educational decisions made at schools. We need social prescriptions for these behaviors so that as a society and as a community member, when we see it happening, we don't just stand by and let it continue. We have to step up and say, that's abusive. Please don't do that. Or withhold your own judgments about how bad that person may be until you hear their side of the story. We also need funding for researchers, for people like Edward and I, who are trying to do this work, and we do it on our own dime, to study this, just like every other type of domestic violence. We need to understand who's likely to perpetrate it, what strategies are they using, what outcomes can we predict, and how is this affecting the entire communities in which people live. We need good research to do that. And all of these have to work in tandem. They cannot, you can't just institute one of these pieces at a time. It will not work. And this is why I think Iceland is actually superbly positioned to be a leader on parental alienation research and practice and, and understanding of, of amelioration. <laughs> Uh, you already have some structural changes going in place to address pay inequity. Um, you could address shared parenting and equalize that. Uh, your population size and the way that in which your social institutions already interact provide a place where these, th these things can work in tandem and actually be effective and serve as a model for the rest of the world. Okay, and finally I'd like to end by saying thank you to my co-authors. A lot of these ideas are drawn from a paper that we are working on, including Edward uh, and our colleague Denise Hines. Uh, and also my book is up there, and I'd like to also encourage you to check out a nonprofit that I'm part of called simplyparent.org, which is a nonprofit designed to provide information and support for parents who are being alienated from their children. I want to thank you so much for your attention today, and I hope that we can all work together to stop this form of family and domestic violence. Thanks.